The youth to be burden bearers. I have written unto you, young men, because you are strong, and the word of God abideth in you, and ye have overcome the wicked one. 1 John 2.14 In order that the work may go forward in all its branches, God calls for youthful zeal, vigor, and courage. He has chosen the youth to aid in the advancement of his cause. To plan with clear mind and execute with courageous hand demands fresh, uncrippled energies. Young men and women are invited to give God the strength of their youth, that through the exercise of their powers, through keen thought and vigorous action, they may bring glory to him and salvation to their fellow men. In view of their high calling, the youth among us should not seek for amusement or live for selfish gratification. The salvation of souls is to be the motive that inspires them to action. In their God-given strength, they are to rise above every enslaving, debasing habit. They are to ponder well the paths of their feet, remembering that where they lead the way, others will follow. No one lives to himself. All exert an influence for good or for evil. Because of this, the apostle exhorts young men to be sober-minded. How can they be otherwise when they remember that they are to be co-workers with Christ, partakers with him of his self-denial and sacrifice, his forbearance and gracious benevolence? To the youth of today, as surely as to Timothy, are spoken the words, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Flee also youthful lusts, but follow righteousness, faith, charity, peace. Be thou an example of the believers, in word, in conversation, in charity, in spirit, in faith, in purity. 2 Timothy 2.15 and verse 22, 1 Timothy 4.12. The burden bearers among us are falling in death. Many of those who have been foremost in carrying out the reforms instituted by us as a people are now past the meridians of life and are declining in physical and mental strength. With the deepest concern, the question may be asked, who will fill their places? To whom are to be committed the vital interests of the church when the present standard bearers fall? We cannot but look anxiously upon the youth of today as those who must take these burdens and upon whom responsibilities must fall. These must take up the work where others leave it, and their course will determine whether morality, religion, and vital godliness shall prevail, or whether immorality and infidelity shall corrupt and blight all that is valuable. Those who are older must educate the youth by precept and example to discharge the claims that society and their maker have upon them. Upon these youth must be laid grave responsibilities. The question is, are they capable of governing themselves and standing forth in the purity of their God-given manhood, abhorring everything that savors of wickedness? Never before was there so much at stake. Never were there results so mighty depending upon a generation as upon these now coming upon the stage of action. Not for one moment should the youth think that they can acceptably fill any position of trust without possessing a good character. Just as well might they expect to gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles. A good character must be built up brick by brick. Those characteristics which will enable the youth to labor successfully in God's cause must be obtained by the diligent exercise of their faculties, by improving every advantage providence gives them, and by connecting with the source of all wisdom. They must be satisfied with no low standard, the characters of Joseph and Daniel are good models for them to follow, and in the life of the Savior they have a perfect pattern. All are given an opportunity to develop character. All may fill their appointed places in God's great plan. The Lord accepted Samuel from his very childhood because his heart was pure. He was given to God a consecrated offering, and the Lord made him a channel of light if the youth of today will consecrate themselves as did Samuel, the Lord will accept them and use them in his work. Of their life, they may be able to say with a psalmist, O God, thou hast taught me from my youth, and hitherto have I declared thy wondrous works. 
Psalm 71, 17. Subheading, The Need of Training Workers. The youth must soon bear the burdens that older workers are now carrying. They have lost time in neglecting to give young men a solid, practical education. The cause of God is constantly progressing, and we must obey the command, go forward. There is need of young men and women who will not be swayed by circumstances, who walk with God, who pray much, and who will put forth earnest efforts to gather all the light they can. The worker for God should pour forth the highest mental and moral energies with which nature, cultivation, and the grace of God have endowed him. But a success will be proportionate to the degree of consecration and self-sacrifice in which his work is done, rather than to either natural or acquired endowments. Earnest, continuous endeavor to acquire qualifications for usefulness is necessary. But unless God works with humanity, nothing good can be accomplished. Divine grace is the great element of saving power. Without it, all human effort is unavailing. Whenever the Lord has a wa- work to be done, he calls not only for the commanding officers, but for all the workers. Today he is calling for young men and women who are strong and active in mind and body. He desires them to bring into the conflict against principalities and powers and spiritual wickedness in high places their fresh, healthy powers of brain, bone, and muscle. But they must have the needed preparation Some young men are urging their way into the work who have no real fitness for it. They do not understand that they need to be taught before they can teach. They point to men who, with little preparation, have labored with a measure of success. But if these men were successful, it was because they put heart and soul into the work. And how much more effective their labors might have been if at the first they had received suitable training. The cause of God needs efficient men. Education and training are rightly regarded as an essential preparation for business life. And how much more essential is thorough preparation for the work of presenting the last message of mercy to the world? This training cannot be gained by merely listening to preaching. In our schools, our youth are to bear burdens for God. They are to receive a thorough training under experienced teachers. They should make the best possible use of their time and study and put into practice the knowledge acquired. Hard study and hard work are required to make a successful minister or a successful worker in any branch of God's cause. Nothing less than constant cultivation will develop the value of the gifts that God has bestowed for wise improvement. A great injury is often done our young men by permitting them to begin to preach when they have not sufficient knowledge of the scriptures to present our faith in an intelligent manner. Some who enter the field are novices in the scriptures. In other things also, they are incompetent and inefficient. They cannot read the scriptures without hesitating, mispronouncing words, and jumbling them together in such a manner that the word of God is abused. Those who cannot read correctly should learn to do so and should become apt to teach before they attempt to stand before the public. The teachers in our schools are obliged to apply themselves closely to study, that they may be prepared to instruct others. These teachers are not accepted until they have passed a critical examination, and their capabilities to teach have been tested by competent judges. No less caution should be used in the examination of ministers, those who are about to enter upon the sacred work of teaching Bible truth to the world, should be carefully examined by faithful, experienced men. The teaching in our schools is not to be the same as in other colleges and seminaries. It is not to be of an inferior order. The knowledge essential to preparing people to stand in the great day of God is to be made the all-important theme. The students are to be fitted to serve God, not only in this life, but in the future life. The Lord requires that our schools shall fit students for the kingdom to which they are bound. Thus they will be prepared to blend in the holy, happy harmony of the redeemed. Let those who have been trained for service now take their places quickly in the Lord's work. House-to-house laborers are needed. The Lord calls for decided efforts to put forth in places where the people know nothing of Bible truth. Singing and praying and Bible readings are needed in the homes of the people. Now, just now is the time to obey the commission 
teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. Matthew 28, 20. Those who do this work must have a ready knowledge of the Scriptures. It is written is to be their weapon of defense. God has given us light on his word that we may give this light to our fellow men. The truth spoken by Christ will reach hearts. A thus saith the Lord will fall upon the ear with power, and fruit will appear wherever honor service is done. Counsel to Teachers, pages 535 to 540.